Evolution involves change over time. Since archaeologists are starting to think about whose history is being unearthed, there has been a recent uptick in initiatives to create a more egalitarian archaeology. It would seem futile to reflect on the past in a year when climate strikes spearheaded by young people have brought global attention to the planet's dire situation. But by doing so, archaeologists are able to learn about prehistoric human diets, find out where individuals came from, keep an eye on old places from above. Murderers? Hippies? Manufacturers of tools? Cooks? No one in the scientific community can agree on what it means to be human, much less when or how humans evolved into this species. How did the human race evolve? How are archaeologists uncovering historical narratives more quickly than in the past? Join us as we explore the earliest documented map and uncover the shocking details it contains about humanity. Man is a piece of work. That much is well acknowledged. When and how did our predecessors develop the distinctive human traits that set us apart from other animals, especially apes? What is it that makes Homo sapiens special? Many hypotheses have been put out during the last hundred years. Some shed light on human evolution while simultaneously revealing the era in which their advocates lived. Man is unique in making tools, anthropologist Kenneth Oakley stated in a 1944 article. Apes make tools out of random things they find, he went on to say. But the shaping of sticks and stones to particular uses was the first recognizably human activity. In the early 1960s, Louis Leakey thought that a species in East Africa called Homo habilis, handy man, which lived about 2.8 million years ago, was responsible for the first tools. Later studies by Jane Goodall and colleagues demonstrated, however, that chimpanzees do in fact shape sticks for specific purposes. For example, they remove the leaves from sticks so that they can fish for insects that live underground. Even without their limbs, crows can still be useful. Our ancestors were carnivores who seized living quarries by violence, battered them to death, tore apart their broken bodies, dismembered them limb from limb, slaking their ravenous thirst with the hot blood of victims and greedily devouring livid writhing flesh. This may sound like pulp fiction now, but following the terrible bloodshed of World War II, anthropologist Raymond Dart's 1953 article describing his killer ape theory resonated. The killer ape gave way to the hippie ape in the 1960s, when anthropologist Glenn Isaac found evidence of animal carcasses that had been deliberately relocated from their original places of death to places where the meat could be shared among the entire commune. Isaac reasoned that people had to share where they could find food, which led to the development of language and other social behaviors that are uniquely human. A little later in the Aquarius era, TV documentary writer Elaine Morgan put forth the idea that our primate ancestors evolved in a watery environment, where they were faster swimmers thanks to the loss of body hair, and while standing upright enabled them to wade. The scientific community has largely rejected the aquatic ape hypothesis, but in 2013, David Attenborough gave his stamp of approval to it. Reed Faring, an archaeologist, thinks our ancestors started to get tough when they learned to throw stones at high speeds. At Demanisi, a hominin site in the former Soviet Republic of Georgia that dates back 1.8 million years, Faring found evidence that Homo erectus instituted public stonings as a means of protecting their prey from predators. The Demanisi people were small, says Faring. This place was filled with big cats, so how did hominins survive? How did they make it all the way from Africa? Rock throwing offers part of the answer. Stoning animals also socialized us, he argues, because it required a group effort to be successful. According to anthropologists Sherwood Washburn and C.S. Lancaster, hunting had far-reaching effects beyond just encouraging cooperation. They stated in a 1968 paper, in a very real sense, our intellect, interests, emotions, and basic social life 
All are evolutionary products of the success of the hunting adaptation. It is believed that hunting also led to a division of labor between the sexes, with women performing foraging, which begs the question, why do women also have big brains? In particular, monogamous sex. The major turning point in human evolution, according to a theory put out in 1981 by C. Owen Lovejoy, was the advent of monogamy six million years ago. Up until that point, the majority of sex occurred between brutish alpha males who drove off rival suitors and monogamous females who preferred males who were better at providing food and staying around to help raise juniors. Our ancestors started walking upright, as Lovejoy explains, because it freed up their hands to carry more groceries home. Big brains are hungry. Gray matter requires 20 times as much energy as muscle does. Some researchers claim that our brains could never have evolved on a vegetarian diet. Instead, our brains grew only after we started eating meat, which is rich in protein and fat, about two to three million years ago. Anthropologist Richard Wrangham says that once our ancestors invented cooking, a behavior unique to humans that makes food easier to digest, they wasted less energy chewing or pounding meat, so had even more energy for their brains. Eventually, those brains grew big enough to make the deliberate decision to become vegan. According to a recent paper, evolutionary geneticist Mark G. Thomas of University College London notes that our DNA contains multiple copies of the gene for amylase, suggesting that it, along with tubers, may have contributed to the explosive growth of the human brain. Another possibility is that carb loading allowed our bigger brains to develop as it was easier for our ancestors to prepare starchy plants like potatoes and potatoes for consumption than meat. Did the pivotal moment in human evolution happen when our ancestors stepped out of the trees and began walking upright? According to the Savannah hypothesis, climate change was the driving force behind this adaptation. When Africa grew drier about three million years ago, the forests shrank and savannas took over. This favored primates who could stand upright, see above the tall grasses to watch for predators, and travel more efficiently across the open landscape where food and water sources were far apart. However, the 2009 discovery of Ardipithecus ramidus, a hominid who lived in what is now Ethiopia, casts doubt on this hypothesis. Even though that region was damp and forested at the time, R.D. could walk on two legs. The emergence of the Homo lineage nearly three million years ago coincided with drastic fluctuations between wet and dry climates, posits Richard Potts, director of the Smithsonian's Human Origins program. Natural selection favored primates that could cope with constant unpredictable change, Potts argues, adding that humans are defined by their adaptability. An intriguing perspective on our origins has been offered by anthropologist Curtis Marian, who presents a theory that is well suited to our interconnected world. According to Marian, humans are the ultimate invasive species. After spending tens of thousands of years on one continent, our ancestors conquered the entire planet. What allowed them to do this? According to Marian, it all started with a genetic predisposition to cooperate, which was born out of conflict rather than altruism. Primate groups that collaborated were able to gain an advantage over rival groups, ensuring that their genes survived. The joining of this unique proclivity to our ancestors' advanced cognitive abilities allowed them to nimbly adapt to new environments, Marian writes. It also fostered innovation, giving rise to a game-changing technology advanced projectile. Then why are all these hypotheses flawed? Although many of them are valid, they all hold the prejudice that we humans can be summed up by a single characteristic or set of characteristics, and that a certain evolutionary stage marked a watershed moment on the path to Homo sapiens. We are the tool-making, stone-throwing, meat and potato-eating, highly cooperative, adaptable, and oh-so-big-brained killer ape that evolved from our ancestors, who weren't beta testers, but were merely surviving as Australopithecus or Homo erectus.
No single trait they acquired was a turning point because the outcome was never certain. However, the discovery of the skull of a three-year-old boy in South Africa in 1924 revolutionized the way people think about our ancestry. The discovery of the Taong child, the earliest evidence of a group of ancient hominins known as Australopithecines, marked a watershed moment in the field of human evolution studies. It moved the center of human origins research away from Asia and Europe and on to Africa, paving the way for the last hundred years of study in the region known as the Cradles of Humankind. Scientists are discovering new things at a rate that no one could have predicted even a generation ago. Human origins textbooks have been revised multiple times since the turn of the millennium. Twenty years ago, nobody could have dreamed that scientists would learn so much about our deep past from a speck of dirt, a scrape of dental plaque, or a spacecraft in orbit. Fossils of humans are spreading more and farther from the original family tree. Several fossils in Africa point to a possible early hominin that lived between five and seven million years ago, when our species most likely diverged from other great apes due to genetic differences. Publication of the 4.4 million year old skeleton dubbed Ardi in 2009 altered scientists' perspectives on how hominins started walking, even though it was found in the 1990s. A few Australopithecines, such as Australopithecus derieremida and Australopithecus sediba, round out our new family tree. We may also have a late surviving early homo cousin, which has sparked renewed discussion over the earliest known instances of human burial practices. Archaeologists used to think Homo sapiens evolved in Africa about 200,000 years ago, but that story has gotten more complicated. Fossils found in Morocco have pushed that date back to 300,000 years ago, which is in line with ancient DNA evidence. This makes us doubt that our species got its start in just one location. Unexpected discoveries from Europe and Asia have also occurred this century, with the Denisovans in Siberia and mysterious hobbits in Flores, Indonesia, suggesting that our ancestors may have encountered a variety of hominins as they migrated out of Africa. A new species from the Philippines was reported this year, among other findings. Today, human evolution appears less like Darwin's tree and more like a muddy braided stream. Anthropologists are realizing that our Homo sapiens predecessors had considerably more contact with other human species than previously believed. The new study of ancient DNA has made possible many recent discoveries. New information about our ancestry and early history has been revealed by data collected from hundreds of people since the first ancient human genome was entirely sequenced in 2010. We also know, shockingly, that modern humans and Neanderthals mated multiple times during the last Ice Age, even though our lineages diverged up to 800,000 years ago. This explains why many modern-day individuals have some Neanderthal DNA. The enigmatic Denisovans, who interbred with Neanderthals, were initially identified by ancient DNA. Although the majority of studies still rely on teeth and bones, it is now feasible to extract ancient DNA from other sources, such as cave dirt and chewing gum that is 6,000 years old. Along with resolving long-running disputes, genetic approaches are recreating family trees and establishing ties between long-lost individuals and modern-day humans. Using ancient seeds and skeletons stashed in museum basements, paleogenomics is revealing startling facts about plants and animals, with implications that extend well beyond the human race. There are other molecules besides DNA that are transforming our understanding of the past. Recent research using paleoproteomics, the study of old proteins, has established a relationship between orangutans and an extinct ape that was nine feet tall and weighed 1,300 pounds. This ape went extinct around two million years ago. Dental calculus, the hardened plaque that your dentist removes from your teeth, is incredibly informative. It has shed light on a wide range of topics, including who was drinking milk 6,000 years ago, the surprising diversity of plants, including medicinal ones, in Neanderthal diets, 
the evolution of the human gut microbiome, and even cultural clues such as a bright blue lapis lazuli found in a medieval nun's calculus, which led historians to reevaluate the authorship of illuminated manuscripts. Ancient infant bottles were those strangely shaped pots discovered all over Bronze and Iron Age Europe, and lipid traces trapped in pottery have shown where milk drinking in the Sahara originated. Using collagen-based barcodes of various animal species, scientists have been able to determine a wide range of answers, from the date of Asian rats' arrival as castaways on ships destined for Africa to the animals utilized to make medieval parchment or to identify microorganisms left behind by a monk's kiss on a page. While biomolecules allow researchers to zoom in on minute details, other methods allow them to zoom out. Aerial photography has been used by archaeologists since the 1930s, but with the advent of widely available satellite imagery, new sites can be found and threatened ones can be monitored. Drones that fly over sites can help investigate their construction process and fight against looting. Originally designed for use in space, LIDAR is now being used to map three-dimensional surfaces and visualize Earth's landscapes. This has led to the discovery of ancient cities forming out of thick vegetation in countries like South Africa, Mexico, and Cambodia. More and more archaeologists are able to accomplish their work without ever excavating a hole thanks to technologies like ground-penetrating radar, which can peek underground from the surface. For example, these technologies have revealed previously unknown structures at Stonehenge. In 2019, more than 250 archaeologists combined their findings to demonstrate that humans have changed the Earth for thousands of years, for instance, with a 2000-year-old irrigation system in China. This is in line with other studies that question the notion that the Anthropocene, the current epoch defined by human impacts on the planet, only started in the 20th century. With the abundance of high-resolution satellite imagery available online, teams are also turning to crowdsourcing to discover new archaeological sites. Artificial intelligence was used to sift through drone and satellite imagery, leading to the discovery of over 140 new Nazca lines, ancient images carved into a Peruvian desert. At the same time, a groundbreaking finding regarding an early hominid suggests that larger brains do not necessarily indicate greater intelligence. A hominid called Homo naledi was found in the rising star cave system in Africa's cradle of humankind in 2013. It possessed human-like limbs and a brain that was one-third the size of a human's, which scientists had previously thought was a sign of significantly lower intelligence compared to its Homo sapien ancestors. However, as a result of a terrifying expedition into the rising star cave, scientists have found evidence that this species, which existed between 335,000 and 236,000 years ago, was the first non-human to ever bury its dead and mark their graves. This finding casts doubt on the idea that larger brains necessarily indicate a more intelligent species. During ongoing excavations in 2018, researchers started to speculate that Homo naledi may have used burial mounds. In July 2022, the suspicions were confirmed and strengthened when paleoanthropologist Lee Berger and colleagues discovered Homo naledi skeletons with carvings on the wall above them, indicating the graves of the buried individuals. According to Berger, the symbols consisted of triangles, squares, and a seemingly hashtag sign consisting of two cross-hatching equal signs. The exact meaning of these carvings remains a mystery, and scientists will investigate the possibility of a random chance that Homo naledi used the same symbols as humans, or if they were inherited from a common ancestor. The question of whether Homo naledi and Homo sapiens interacted remains unanswered. Both species would have coexisted around 250,000 years ago, and scientists are now analyzing the molecular biology of the fossils to find any signs of human DNA. Berger described the discovery as striking and shocking 
because it disproves the concept of human exceptionalism, the idea that humans are unique and superior to other animals because of their large brains. Homo naledi, on the other hand, had a brain size comparable to that of a chimpanzee and yet engaged in ritual burials, a practice previously thought to be unique to humans. Based on the placement of bones in the cave and the chambers adjacent to them, scientists have also learned that Homo naledi had fire and that they ate certain types of animals. They also discovered that prior to this discovery, researchers knew very little about the behavior of the species and may have even been interring artifacts with the bodies in the graves. Out of nowhere, we moved from learning about the fascinating anatomy of a single species to a whole civilization. This species is defined by a proportion of its body mass that is disproportionately short and stocky compared to its predicted epoch of existence. Between 250,000 and 350,000 years ago, coinciding with the epoch in which modern humans are evolving. This groundbreaking scientific event will undoubtedly pave the way for more investigation and new findings in the coming decades. There is a rising agreement that studying the past requires reaching across disciplines, even though new collaborations between archaeologists and scientific experts aren't always tension-free. More and more scientists, especially archaeologists, are disseminating their findings both inside and outside of academic institutions. Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.